there is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. and praying that God will speak to all of our hearts. I want you to open the Word of God with me to the Gospel according to John, to John chapter number 20. John chapter 20 and John chapter 21 are the two chapters that I want us to study together today, tomorrow, and the last day that we're together. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Forgive me for using a dirty word on Sunday, but I'm going to give you a homework assignment. And your homework assignment is I'm going to ask you to read through these two chapters of the Bible every day during this meeting, every day. So no matter where you are devotionally, where you are are with your family, I'm going to ask you to take John chapter 20, John chapter 21, and just adopt them, make them your own during this meeting. So this is, this is what you call real public invitation. How many of you will do that and you'll commit to it this morning? Would you raise your hand, please? That's good. If I could give you a couple of recommendations, one thing I'd recommend to you is that you read them out loud. It'll do your heart good. When you read the Scriptures aloud, all of your faculties are working together, and it helps you concentrate. And then another suggestion I would give to you is at some point in the next three days, read them on your knees. There's something about reading the Scripture on your knees that leads you to prayer. You know, there's something truly wonderful, and I mean this, truly wonderful about us talking to God about what God is talking to us about. And when you let the Scriptures lead you into the presence of God, lead you to prayer, I'm telling you, it does something for your soul. It'll give substance to your prayers. It'll increase your faith. And I promise you it will open the Word of God to you in a fresh way. Now, let me just get this out of the way. I have nothing new to give you. So if you're looking for some new thing today, I hear preachers sometimes bemoaning. They say, you know, I've preached Easter services for decades. And how many different things can you say about the resurrection? That misses the point. It's not a new thing we need. It's a fresh glimpse of eternal truth. And the thing that I have been just thrilled with this week is to see the freshness of the Word of God in my own heart again. And I hope you'll find that. And I really am praying this. I'm praying that not only will God speak to you in the meetings but that God will speak to you through your own private meeting with Him. And that through your time and your family's time in the Word, God will do something. I was preaching in Arizona a few weeks ago. Grant was actually with me on that trip, just the two of us. And I was preaching through a certain book of the Bible. I'm trying to remember now what book of the Bible I was even in. I think Philemon. And uh, that one, one chapter book. And we, we were having a great time going through it. And a lady walked up to me one night. She was in her 80s, well-dressed, very articulate, very reserved. And she said to me, Preacher, you preached through these verses tonight, but you missed a phrase. (laughs) And I said, What phrase is that? We opened our Bible, and she pointed to it, and I smiled, and I said, Yes, ma'am. I'm coming back to that phrase tomorrow night. I kid you not, I've never had this happen before. She gave me a high five in the lobby of the church. (laughs) And let me tell you what thrilled me. It thrilled me that she was excited about the Word of God. And I hope one of the things that grows out of this meeting is just fall in love with the Bible all over again. And look with me at John chapter 20 and verse number 1. The Bible says the first day of the week. What day is that, church? Right. Sunday's not the end of the week. It's not the weekend. It's the first day of the week. Uh, l- let me do something before we read on. There's a lot of debate over what day Jesus died on. A lot of debate. You may have taught this. I have no idea. Your pastor and I haven't discussed it. He and I may not fully agree. That's possible. You know, I learned early on, don't be adamant about something that Scripture is not adamant on. But I I will tell you this with certainty, he didn't die on Friday. It's real hard to get three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday morning, I'm just telling you. Now, how many of you believe he died on Wednesday? Anybody? How many of you believe he died on Thursday? How many of you don't know? Thank you for your honesty. God bless you. I think, I think from my study, he died on Thursday. But I could be wrong about that. 
just knowing how the Jewish day falls and starts at 6 o'clock in the evening and on and on and on. Uh, somebody said, well, it had to be before the Sabbath. That's where they come up with Friday. Friday was a high Sabbath. So there's lots of reasons behind why I think he died on Thursday. But let me just say this to you. It really doesn't matter. What matters is he died. How many of you know he died? And what's even greater is he rose from the dead. And here's the glorious truth. God makes no mistake about what day he rose on. He rose on the first day of the week. So look at it. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark under the sepulcher and seeth the stone take it away from the sepulcher. You know, God does a lot of big things early in the morning. I said to my wife this morning early, I was in my Bible reading this morning in Exodus. That's a long ways from the garden tomb. You know that? But I was in Exodus this morning, and I noticed something. You've probably seen it a hundred times, but I've read it many times and missed it. It dawned on me that the crossing of the Red Sea happened all through the night, but the victory didn't come till the morning. Read it for yourself. In the morning, the Lord said to the sea, all right, that's enough, and covered the Egyptians. Look, weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning that's what mary found look at verse number two then she runneth and cometh to simon peter and to the other disciple whom jesus loved and saith unto them they have taken away the lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they've laid him peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher so they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun peter and came first to the sepulcher by the way i've got to show you this who's writing these words Right, the one who beat Peter to the tomb. There's a little humor in this, you know. I beat him. I got there before he did. John, we think, was younger than Peter, so maybe that was the reason. I don't know. Now, the Bible says in verse 5, And he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then come a Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher. That's about like Peter, isn't it? Always barging in first. And seeth the linen clothes lying. And the napkin... That was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. And notice verse 9. For as yet, as yet they knew not the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Let me just stop here for a second. Isn't it shocking? They walked with him for three and a half years. How long have you been a Christian? How long have you been a follower of Jesus? This year for me is 37 years. 37 years ago, I became a follower of Christ. On the count of three, I want you to shout out how long you've been a Christian. One, two, three. Congratulations. That's wonderful. If it was a week or if it was 50 years, it's wonderful to be a follower of Christ. Would you agree? Yet these men had been followers of Jesus for three and a half years They'd listen to everything Jesus said to them about his death, burial, and resurrection over the closing months of his life, and as yet, they still didn't understand it. It wasn't that they didn't know it factually. By the way, some of the most arrogant Christians I've ever met are the people that always win Bible trivia (laughs) because they have all the answers. Oh, preacher, we've heard all that before. And remember what Paul said, knowledge puffeth up. That's why the Bible says we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because knowledge can fill your head. But if grace doesn't fill your heart, you've got a real problem. See, knowledge can lift a man up. Let me tell you what grace does. Grace brings him low. Grace reminds him, look, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how many Sunday school classes you've been in. You may have taught the Bible for decades. But, friend, without a fresh experience of the grace of God every day, we're in trouble, real trouble. And so as yet, they knew not the Scripture, so they go home. The Bible says in Luke 24 that Peter left the tomb wondering, just scratching his head, trying to figure it out. Now come to the end of the chapter. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. Look at verse number 24. Jesus has now appeared to all the disciples. And the Bible says, but Thomas, one of the twelve. By the way, that phrase is only used one of the time in the Scriptures, and it's for Judas. One of the twelve. In other words, watch, he was in the number, but something was missing. 
excuse me, he was in Sunday school. He was, he was in the number. Something's missing here. Is one of the twelve called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And saith he to Thomas, <laughs> Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. By the way, I think that may be one of the greatest professions of faith in the whole of Scripture. Can I tell you something I've learned? Sometimes the people who are the biggest doubters become the strongest believers. When the victory finally comes, I went through a season of real doubt in my own life many years ago. And I want you to know when the light finally breaks through on people like that, there might even be somebody like that in this room today filled with questions. Look, at some point with a fresh glimpse of Jesus, God's going to take your question mark, straighten it all out, and make it an exclamation point. And you're going to be one of the greatest witnesses for Christ because the Lord's going to have given you personal victory through faith in Him. And I love Jesus' words, not just to Thomas, but for us. Verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Why am I starting here today? In the next hour, we're going to come back to Mary, the first one to see him on Resurrection Sunday. But I'm starting here with these men who are called out by name because I think that's where we have to start. Isn't it funny that on Easter Sunday, everybody's mind immediately goes to this where we want to see lost people saved. Let's just take a church survey. How many of you would like to see some lost people saved today? I've been praying for that. I heard specific names called in this room in prayer last night. We're praying for the salvation of lost sinners today. But could I remind you of something very important? In John chapter 20, when Jesus came out of the grave, he did not first appear to a bunch of lost people. He first appeared, watch this, to his own disciples. Wait, 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 not just to his own disciples. Watch this. He first showed up to some of the disciples that were the closest to him. As a matter of fact, there are 12 original disciples, and three of them are found, identified for us by the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20. Who are they? They are Peter, John, and Thomas. Now, that doesn't sound like the three we normally put together, does it? We would say, let's talk about the inner circle. Let's talk about Peter, James, and John. And yet... In John chapter 20, you've got Peter, John, and Thomas. And here's what we love to do. Don't we love to pick on Thomas? Matter of fact, there's a little adjective we use for Thomas. Well, what's the word we always put before his name? We call him what, Thomas? There you know him, doubting Thomas. The cynic, the skeptic, the guy who will not believe. And yet I must say to you, as I've read and meditated on John 20 this week, it's not just Peter and John and Thomas I see. I see me. Interesting when you see yourself in Scripture, isn't it? I'm in John 20. And by the way, don't act so pious. You're there too. When you open the mirror of the Word of God, what does the mirror show? Oh, it gives you a glimpse of God, but in the light of that, it gives you a glimpse of yourself. Now, beginning in the Sunday school, in the Bible study hour, with this subject today. Maybe you'd like to write it down somewhere just to meditate on it. I'm speaking today on the spiritual need of every Christian on Easter. What is your spiritual need today? And you're going to say, preacher, you don't even know me. You couldn't know my spiritual need. No, I don't know you, but God knows all of us. And the amazing thing is that Peter's need and John's need and Thomas's need are the same. And not only is it common to them, it's common to us. You see, everything the Holy Spirit puts in Scripture, He puts there for a reason. There there is an application there for us. There is an implication there for us. Look, these men are different. They're very different. As a matter of fact, there's a little glimpse in each of their personalities in this chapter. Everybody look at the person next to you for just a moment. Would you look at them? Stare at them just a second. Just gaze into their lovely eyes, would you? Some of you sat next to the wrong person. I'm sorry about that. 
How many think the person looks all dressed up nice for Easter? Yes, they did well today, didn't they? Good. But you know what you're looking at? You're looking at someone very different from you. We're all different. As a matter of fact, what do we know about Peter? What do we know about John? What do we know about Thomas? Did you know that there's a little window in each of their personalities in this one passage that we've read? For example, what do we know about Peter? Look at verse number 6. John stays outside the tomb. What does Peter do? As soon as he gets there, he busts right in. What is Peter? He's impulsive. He's just impulsive, quick to answer, quick to act, quick to react, quick to step into something he shouldn't step in the middle of. Mr. Impulsive, maybe you find yourself in Peter. And then there's John. What do we know about John? He does not use his own name, for he's the one writing. But notice the little phrase in verse number 2. I love this expression, whom Jesus loved. Remember, in another place, the Bible says he's the one who leaned on Jesus' breast at supper. If Peter is the impulsive, John is the intimate. He is the closest disciple to Christ. He is the beloved apostle. He is the one that seems to have a more personal fellowship with the Lord Jesus than perhaps any of the other. He's he's entered into a depth the others have not yet experienced. Maybe that's why God chooses him to write the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's beautiful to see John. And then, then there's Thomas. And if Peter is the impulsive and John is the intimate, Thomas is the inquisitive. He's the guy always asking questions. Except I shall see the print of the nails in his hands, I will not believe. You think that's the first time he questioned? As a matter of fact, the first time we're introduced to him is when Jesus decides he's going to go up to Jerusalem and all the disciples are trying to stop him. And Thomas speaks up and here's exactly what he says. Boy, this is full of faith, isn't it? Come on, fellas, let's go with him so we can die with him there. By the way, he's not going to die with him there. He's going to turn and flee like the rest of the disciples. And the next time it shows up, did you ever notice, was in John 14. When Jesus says he's going to prepare a place for us. And Thomas is the one who speaks up and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. He's inquisitive. He's always full of questions. And yet watch this. Oh, may the Spirit of God open our understanding here. Peter and John and Thomas were very different men that all had the same spiritual need. And I want to tell you on the authority of the Word of God today that though we're all different, I'm different from you and you from me, and we don't even know one another that well yet, I want you to know we all have a deep spiritual need, and it is all reflected and revealed in the experience of these disciples on the first Resurrection Sunday morning. Let me give these thoughts to you. I'd like for you to write them down somewhere, perhaps, so you can think on them a little more through the course of this day. Number one, I want you to write down that God reveals what it is we're missing. What are we missing? If you had stopped any of those disciples on that first resurrection on Sunday and said, what's missing this morning? You know what they would have said? Jesus' body. We've been to the tomb. He's gone. The stones rolled away. The soldiers have disappeared. And what's worse, inside, the grave clothes are there, and the napkin on his head is folded in a place by itself, but his body's gone. We're missing the body of Jesus. Please hear me with your heart for just a moment. What was missing that morning was not Jesus' body. It was their own faith. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say to you, they represent what I would refer to as unbelieving believers. If I ask you this morning, are you a believer? Outside the U.S., that's an expression that people understand. Traveling, preaching in different places around the world, I've come to ask people, not are you, are you saved? They don't always understand. They're, are you born again? They don't always understand that term. But if I say, are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? They understand that term. And if I ask you this morning, are you a believer? You'd say, oh, yes, I'm a believer. And you'd tell me about the day you got saved. But listen to me, please. Faith is not just how you come to Christ. It's how you follow Christ. The just shall live by his faith. In other words, faith is never past tense. It must always be present tense. And I want to say to you that I think one of the great missing elements in the life of most Christians, watch please, is simple, daily, exuberant, dynamic, vibrant faith for right where they're living. As a matter of fact, in Jesus' hometown, they missed it. Do you know why we know so little about Nazareth now? It's not because it was a little agricultural village of 
less than 300 people in the time of Jesus. As a matter of fact, it became famous because Jesus was called Jesus of what? Nazareth. And that's got a message all in its own. But do you understand Jesus would have made that his ministry headquarters? That everything he would have done would have launched out of Nazareth? And yet, you can read it for yourself in the gospel records. The Bible says he could there do no mighty work because of their what? The one thing that limits God is our unbelief. And as an evangelist, I travel all the time, and I hear people in churches say, I tell you, preacher, our community really needs a spiritual wake-up call. Friends, it doesn't start in the community. It starts in the church. Pardon me, but it doesn't start with lost people believing on Christ. It starts with saved people believing on Christ. And may I ask you this morning, what is it you're not trusting God with right now? What is it in your family you're still trying to fix on your own? What is it in, in your personal situation, your finances, your health, your whatever, that you're trying to take care of without God's enabling power? Oh, you say you trust him and you even pray about it. Did you know it's possible to pray and not pray in faith? Prayer is no substitute for faith. And sometimes people go through the motions of prayer and the mechanics of prayer and even say all the right things, but there's really no faith in it. Who's the person that you know needs to be brought back to God, but you've almost given up on them. You want to see God do something mighty this week? That didn't come with the preacher. I'm sorry. That comes when God begins to move and work. And I'll tell you, the one thing that will limit God in your family, in your life, and in this church, and in this town, the one thing that will limit the power of God is our own unbelief. See, that's why Hebrews 11 verse 6 says that without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And this is the thing that struck me this week. Did it ever dawn on you that Peter and John were guilty of the exact same sin Thomas was? See, we love to pick on Thomas, doubting Thomas. But I want you to see something. Look, please, what the Bible says in verse number 8. The Bible says, Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he, what, church? He saw and what? Notice, please, he did not believe until he what? Wait a minute. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Watch this, please. Peter did not believe until he saw. John did not believe until he saw. And Thomas did not believe until he saw. Before you get too quick to judge the unbelief in somebody else's life, judge the unbelief in your own life. Well, the great thing missing in most churches is real faith. Someone asked me the other day, they said, in your travels and all these different churches, well, what's something you're seeing that, that is troubling you? And I, I guess they imagine I was going to say trends in music or, or a failure in soul winning or whatever, but my answer was this without hesitation. The number one thing I see that is most grievous is this, very, very low expectations. They have a meeting to have a meeting. It's that time of year. They have revival, but they have no revival. Do you know why they have no revival? Because they're not actually expecting God to show up. They have their prayer meetings and even give their prayer requests and pass out prayer bulletins, but there's no earnest expectant seeking of God because they really don't think that's going to happen. A man even came up to me the other day in Ohio, and he said, you know, preacher, he said, I appreciate your message today, but I don't think we're going to have revival. And I said to that man, if I believed what you just said, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be sitting home in my lazy boy. Because I'm not traveling for health or for fun. I actually believe God wants to do something. And when we stop believing that, friends, we begin immediately to limit the power of God. The one thing that we most lack is the one thing that most limits our God, and that is our unbelief. And the sad reality is what that man said, we shake our hands and say, that's a shame. But he really just articulated what most people actually think. He just had the audacity to say it. Because what is missing in most of our lives is this. We are not truly believing God like we ought to believe God. Oh, but that's not all. Would you write down a second thing? God reveals to us not only what they were missing, but why they were missing it. See, there's always a reason. There's always a root sin. Unbelief grows out of something. Look at verse number 9, for as yet. As yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again 
from the dead. I want you to write this down somewhere, please. The reason they did not believe is that the Scriptures had not really become real to them. Well, they knew it, but they didn't know it. As a matter of fact, the word know in verse number 9 is a word that represents spiritual understanding. Their, their eyes being opened, the, the Holy Spirit having illuminated it to their hearts and minds. Let me show you something interesting. Let's do something. Mark this in your Bible. Go back to verse 5. Peter shows up at the tomb first, right? And he's stooping down and looking in. What's the next word, church? I want you to circle the word saw in verse number 5. Now come to verse 6. Then come a Simon Peter following him. And went into the sepulcher and what? Circle seeth, the linen clothes lie in verse number 6. Then come to verse 8. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he what? Saul, circle Saul. Did you know that those are actually three different words? <laughs> in our English Bible, we say, well, they saw, they saw, they saw. But actually, the words of Jesus' day had little shades of varying meaning let me show you what they are. The word in verse number 5 where he saw the linen clothes yet went not in literally means he glanced in. Excuse me, please. He caught a little glimpse of it and that sufficed. By the way, there's a whole lot of Christians like that. They want enough of Jesus to go to heaven, just a glimpse of him, but they really don't want to gaze upon him. Excuse me, Sunday's enough. There's a cursory glance at God. I want you to know that will never bring the, the spiritual awakening that we need. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. How about the second one? The word seeth in verse number 6, it literally means examining. So Peter goes deeper. Oh, I wonder, will we go deeper with God this week? Will we go all the way in? Will we press into the presence of God? We become hungry and thirsty after righteousness. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Will we say with Moses, show me now thy glory that I may know thee. Will we say with Paul, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. In other words, a glance is not enough for me. I've got to examine this. I've got to, I've got to get personally acquainted with this myself. But there's a third word in verse number 8. It's the one connected to faith. He saw and believed. And I want you to write down that the word saw there literally means he saw it with understanding. I love this. There was a moment when the light came on. You ever had one of those moments like in the middle of a church service, your pastor's preaching or teaching through the Bible, and suddenly the light comes on. Isn't that wonderful? You ever had a moment in your private devotions when you're reading the Bible? It may even be a familiar text, and all of a sudden, something jumps off the page, and the Holy Ghost waves it at you, and you say, oh, I get that now. Isn't it wonderful? You ever have a moment when you're witnessing to somebody, and they're puzzled, and they're not getting it, and all of a sudden, you see the change even on their countenance when the light comes on? Oh, I tell you, there's nothing like it. From a preacher's perspective, you know what I'm talking about. It's thrilling to see the Spirit of God move in hearts where they don't just give intellectual assent to it. They actually get it. They see it with understanding. I'm going to tell you the real problem here. The real problem was that they were faithless, and they were faithless because they did not fully understand the Scriptures. Listen to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You know what Thomas missed? Somebody said, yeah, he missed seeing the Lord. That's not just it. After that, the other disciples said, we have seen him. They testified to it. And he heard that, but he refused to believe that. Thought-provoking, isn't it? And I'd like to ask you a personal question this morning. I know who I'm speaking to. I know who comes to Sunday school. What is it you're missing? I didn't ask how long have you been saved or how much Bible do you know. I asked this question What's the spiritual truth that's not yet really come alive in your heart to the point where it's become a part of the very fabric of who you are and affected the way you lived your life? You know one interesting thing about John's account of the resurrection? If you compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John's the last one written. It's, it's the interpretive record, really, of the other three. But when you read John's record in John chapter 20, did you ever notice that he gives no details about the event of the resurrection? Zero. Matthew does, Mark does, Luke does, John, no. John just simply states he was gone. Why is that? Watch this, please. 
Because John's emphasis and the lasting emphasis Christ gives us is not simply the event of the resurrection. It is the effect that it has had upon our lives. John 20 and John 21 is all about how the resurrection of Christ, the risen Christ himself, affected the lives of other people. And I must tell you, I'm sick and tired of Easter services where all we do is talk about the details of the event and never get down to the basic nitty-gritty of life, and that is how is that going to affect the way I live my life every day? Because we can all sit and rehash yet again and again the details of the first Easter, the first Resurrection Sunday. But I want to ask you a question. Are you living in faith and victory and power at this moment? Because if you're not, you're missing the very reason for which Christ rose from the dead. And that is that we would know Him deeply and intimately and walk every day by faith. And so there's a third thing I want you to write down quickly, and it is this. God not only shows us what we're missing and why we're missing it, But he shows us where to start. (laughs) Where do you begin? Where does this begin to get corrected? And this is what God brought me to as I meditated through this chapter this week. Come to verse number 29. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. (laughs) i got to stop here. Isn't it beautiful? Jesus adds another beatitude. Look at Jesus' beatitude. We know the blessed are they that hunger and thirst and blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn. But look at this one. He says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Would you do something? Take your pen and in the margin of your Bible next to verse number 29, just write, that's me. Don't you love to find yourself on the pages of Holy Scripture? He's talking about you and me. Anybody in this room ever seen Jesus? I'm talking about physically. Anybody ever seen him? I don't think so. And if you say you had, I'd say, oh, let's talk about that for a second. And for the record, we're all going to see him. Could be today. You want to talk about a resurrection Sunday to remember. Wouldn't it be great if, if resurrection Sunday were the day Jesus split the eastern sky? Oh, it could happen any moment, friend. I'm going to see him as he is. I'm going to be like him even more. But watch this, please. I, I've not seen him, and yet, thank you, Holy Spirit, for this. I have believed. Not because I got more faith than Peter and John or Thomas, but because the Holy Spirit of God has worked in my heart to show me Jesus in the Word of God. And by faith, I caught a glimpse of him, and he changed my life. No wonder Jesus said, Blessed. Friends, it is a blessing. As a matter of fact, there's a blessing connected to faith that is not connected to any other thing in life. You want to unlock God's greatest blessings on this church? This is a blessed church. But you want to unlock all of heaven for this church? Let this church be a people full of faith in God. You want to see God's blessing on your children and your grandchildren? Then exercise faith in God as you pray for them. Pray big prayers to a big God in faith, believing. You want to take the next step in your own Christian life? Listen, friends, that's not just doing something. That's believing God. And when you believe God, you'll do whatever God tells you to do. The next step is always a step of faith. Always. And now we come to the end of the chapter. How many of you believe our God's a God of order? Yes? And watch, there's a progressive revelation here. I used to stop my reading in verse 29 and say, well, that's ended. But no, look at the first word of verse 30. What is it, church? And, read on, and many other things, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Watch, here's where we start. If we want to be people of faith and we want to grow in our walk with Christ and we want to know the Lord as he wants us to know him, watch this, we must fall in love with what is written in the word of God again. We must become people of the book. One of the things I'm trying to emphasize everywhere I go in every meeting is that we need a revival of Bible reading. People say, we need a revival, preacher. A revival of what? What's that look like? It just means the building's full? People are excited? Somebody got saved? No. 
Let me tell you when you'll know revivals come, when you passionately fall in love with the God of the Bible. When the Bible is a fresh book to you. You remember when you first got saved and you were so excited to just read it? You didn't even understand it all, but the Lord was teaching you and showing you things. You remember, you used to come to church and you'd open your Bible and you'd show a fellow church member, look what I found this week, like you were the first person to ever find it. And they would say, I've seen that a hundred times. But it was the joy of your own discovery of God. It was the joy of your own personal walk of faith. We need to get back to that. And if you think my sermons or your pastor's sermons on the Lord's Day and Wednesday night is going to be enough for you to walk the walk of faith and live in resurrection power and victory, friend, you're going to be sorely disappointed and disillusioned. Every believer, every Peter, every John, every Thomas, every Scott, everybody must get into the Word of God and let the Word of God get into them. And as that happens, friend, you'll see the resurrection power of Christ at work. Your faith will grow. You believe on the Lord. I love the last verse. Look at the last verse. He said, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and. See, some people stop at the first part of that verse. And they say, well, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That's not just life eternal. That's life abundant. That's not just life later. That's life now. That's not just heaven. That's here on earth. That's victory and power. God says everything that you need, all things that pertain to life and godliness, he's given us, and we neglect it. We dust it off for Sunday school. We read our chapter and check our box and think we've done God a spiritual favor. I ask you, when was the last time you gazed at the Lord Jesus on the pages of Holy Scripture and so met with God that the Lord just came alive in your spirit and your faith grew? Because, friend, that's what resurrection life looks like. We don't just need revival meetings. We need revived lives. And that begins in the Word of God. See, there's method to the madness. There's a reason I've asked you for the next three days to meditate and pray and read and study through these two chapters. Do you know why? Because I'm convinced of something. You're going to forget my sermons, and that's okay. You're not going to remember my name. You're not going to remember my outlines, and I'm okay with that. But I know something, if the Word of God gets deeply in every one of us, friends, we will never be the same again. And we'll point to this meeting as a life-changing meeting, not because we were here, but because we met God in His Word at this time. And then I leave you with this closing thought. I want you to look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Then the disciples went away again to their own home. Is that shocking? Now, Mary's going to stay at the tomb. We're going to see her in just a minute. But they went home for breakfast. I mean, they just showed up at an empty tomb, and he's not there, so they just go home. And I come over to verse number 26. The Bible says about Thomas, after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Do you understand that Peter and John went home with that real spiritual understanding? And do you understand that Thomas lived eight days without having the Lord really... Alive in his heart and mind. And I want to ask you a question. How do you intend to go home today? When this meeting's over, and it'll be over. If Jesus lets us live and tears is coming in just a couple days, I'll be on my way, and you'll be back to your regular routine and schedule of life. When this meeting is over and done, how will we be different? How will we go home? I, let me just testify. I want the deepest spiritual need of my own heart met in this resurrection revival meeting. Because, friends, I'm not talking at you. I'm talking to you about my need. That's what I need. A fresh glimpse of Christ and a growing faith. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit, and don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.